Welcome everyone. It is so great to see all of you here. We're so excited that you're joining us for Black Maternal Health Week at our April Collaboratory entitled Coping with the Reality of Anti-Blackness in America, Black Moms Discuss the 400-Year Holocaust. So my name is Alexis Cobbins. I'm the Executive Director of the California Preterm Birth Initiative, and I'm also your moderator today. If this is your first event with the California Preterm Birth Initiative, we welcome you to join us every month at our collaboratory series to think through and generate new ideas, collaborations, and innovative approaches to preventing preterm delivery and improving outcomes for babies born too soon. This month, our organizational highlight is the country's oldest Black-owned independent bookstore founded in 1960 in the San Francisco Fillmore, Marcus Books. If you are interested in getting a copy of The 400-Year Holocaust, we encourage you to purchase at Marcus Books online or in person at their Oakland shop. We also have a special book giveaway for this event. The first 10 people to sign up to stay connected with Dante at his website will receive a free and signed copy of the book. The links will be in the chat for sign up to sign up for Dante's newsletter or to buy the book from Marcus Books. So for our agenda today, we will first hear from author and anti-racism scholar Dante King, who will share insights from his book. Everyone attending today will be asked to participate actively and engage with the presentation through a digital platform, Poll Everywhere or poll.ed. We will share the Poll Everywhere link in the chat and we hope you will all participate. Next, I will be moderating a panel discussion with the incredible Black mothers, grandmothers, and advocates you see on your screen, Julie Harris, Daphina Melbourne, Kim Coleman-Fox, and Marguerite Malloy. Throughout the session, we encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A section, and then we'll have some time for your questions at the end. Finally, before we begin, I want to highlight that we are celebrating the fifth anniversary of Black Maternal Health Week this year. Founded and led by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, this campaign is a week of awareness, activism, and community building. Black Maternal Health Week takes place every year from April 11th through 17th and was officially recognized by the White House exactly one year ago today. We intend for our event to contribute to this campaign by amplifying the voices of Black Mamas and centering the values of birth justice. And so we know it's important to have um, a Black Maternal Health Week to uplift the experience, the unique experiences that Black women are facing sitting at the intersection of race and gender. And, you know, Dante's work around bringing light to anti-Blackness is also helping to uplift the experiences that Black women and Black mothers are going through every day. And so with that being said, I want to introduce Dante King. Dante King is a native of San Francisco, He's an author, historian, a scholar, a thought leader, facilitator, and a coach. He is also a human resources professional specializing in the implementation of anti-racist practice, organizational development, and change. I mean, I, I read his bio, but I also want to add that he is a humanitarian. He is a voice for those of us that have been voiceless. He has put words to our experience, and we're also honored um, to be with Dante and to have Dante bring this to light for the world to see. And so without further ado, welcome Dante. Hi, thank you, Alexis. Um, and I first want to say thank you to everyone uh, who is taking time out to acknowledge and support Black maternal health uh, overall, not just this week. Um, I also want to give a personal thanks to you, Alexis, who happens to be um, a very close ally, co-conspirator, professional colleague, and a personal friend. Um, she's also the director of the California Preterm Birth Initiative. I want to acknowledge uh, and thank Assistant Director Solera Spellin, uh, Principal Investigator Larry, Dr. Larry Rand, as well as the team of other leaders and staff at the California Preterm Birth Initiative. So thank you all for the ways in which you've uh, supported and uplifted my work, but also are working toward um, justice and in, in, in support of Black people. I especially want to uh, give a shout out and a, a special thanks to the ladies that you see here on the screen. 
um, Dafina Melbourne, I love you much, Marguerite Malloy, uh, Julie Harris, Kim Coleman Fox, um, and also Jayantra Henderson, um, and uh, Selena Lau, who has worked so diligently in making sure that this event could happen. Um, I want to um, personally uplift my, my own mother. Her name is Deborah King Cooper, and she is somewhere watching this at the moment. Um, but I want to say from my heart that I could not be here. I could not survive being a Black male presenting person in white America without your continued love, support, upliftment that is given um, through our talks, spiritually, your prayers, uh, everything. So thank you for all that you have done for me and continue to do for me. Um, I want to, uh, before I go into this, just raise up again that this event is being supported by uh, Marcus Books. And I want to give a special thanks to Blanche Richardson, who is the owner of Marcus Books. It is the oldest Black-owned bookstore in the country. Um, and I think that just deserves so much praise and attention. So if you all um, could really, in this endeavor, if you don't have the book, go online and, and purchase the book, and not just from anywhere, but go, please go to Marcus Books. Um, and you can actually go there now um, if you can, or right after there will be a link or is a link that's in the chat. Um, lastly, I want to give a special thanks to Lauren Newman, who uh, so graciously allowed us to use her photo. And she's also a personal friend of mine and works for the California Preterm Birth Initiative. So um, here's the book at Marcus Books. And if you are seeking additional information about what it is I'm going to be presenting and sharing today, which is kind of the, the crux and foundation of the panel discussion, please feel free to take time to uh, go to UCSF's website and under their continuing medical education programs. And there's a course that I actually teach, which is called Understanding the Roots of Racism and Bias, Anti-Blackness and its Links to Whiteness, White Racism, Privilege and Power. Um, I'm going to drop the, I think the links are in the chat. I'm gonna put the links in the chat, there they go. Um, and one second, something happened with my meeting controls. <laughs> Give me one second, everybody. Oh, there they go. <laughs> Technology. Okay, so there's my mom. I just wanted to give her a shout out. That's me and her. She's my best friend in the entire world. I also want to dedicate today's program to one of my best friends who actually passed away last year. She was in her mid forties and she died from cancer. Her name was Lenitra Ann Williams. And so she is here with me today in spirit. She was, um, she called herself the maternal maven. You know, she was a social worker. She was also a public health nurse by trade. And she worked diligently on behalf of making sure that black women and particularly uh, black birthing people and mothers were healthy, uh, both mind, body, and all in both in all of mind, body, and spirit. So I just want to um, give a special thanks for her and just have maybe a five second moment of silence. All right, um, so I'm gonna talk about anti-Blackness and lay a foundation. Um, and this is what my book is really about, the intentionality behind um, constructing systems and institutions using um, at the core uh, white supremacy in terms of total domination over black people and all such other groups to um, create not only just a caste system or racism, but to create a, an orientation where Black people uh, will forever be attempting to overcome, grapple with, survive cultural terrorism that's been enacted and um, designed into American systems and culture. Uh, so anti-Blackness involves the criminalization, hyper-negativity, hyper-scrutiny, and negative positioning of Blackness embedded into the American cultural psychology. 
So it's not just merely implicit bias, it's embedded into the way, all of the ways in which we understand and or relate to or come to what it means to be black, um, anything that we uh, perceive as being filtered through a black orientation. And it's very important to understand that it's been perpetuated again through all of American institutions and, and culture. Um, so legal, social, political, economic, and all others. Um, I'm going to share a few quotes by Dr. Amos Wilson. And one of the things he says of many, he says the primary function of anti-Black racism uh, and discrimination is not simply to be mean, but to impair the psychology and consciousness of Black people. And I want to offer and invite for you all to sit with that as I go into sharing some examples of what I mean. And this is my research. It's more so uh, framed through a qualitative examination rather than um, the main ways or in, in, uh, widely accepted principles of, of, of uh, quantitative uh, research or principles. So here's one, here's the first example, right? Black newborns more likely to die when looked after by white doctors. Black newborn babies in the United States are more likely to survive childbirth if they are cared for by black doctors, but three times more likely, to, more likely than white babies to die when looked after by white doctors, a study has found. The mortality rate of black newborns in hospitals in, a, in hospital shrunk by between 39 and 58% when black physicians took charge of the birth, according to the research, which laid bare how shocking racial disparities in human health can affect even the first hours of a person's life. And so with these examples, I'm trying to go through a chronological framing of this, right? So that is at birth. Here's an example of uh, pre-puberty. We're not hearing the sound right now, Dante. Oh, you're not hearing the sound? Thank you for stopping me. That's my Kimmy, for anyone that doesn't know Kim Coleman Fox, Dr. Kim Coleman Fox. Um, thank you, Kimmy. All right, here we go. We're gonna try this again. And Natalie, there were also, there were uh, two children, two girls actually affected by this policy, this hair policy. Now they do have the option to return to classes, but so far they have not done that. Their attorneys say they plan to meet with school officials and their attorneys on Monday and hopefully work something out. Now we're talking about that viral video that shows an 11 year old girl in tears leaving her school because of her hairstyle. Well, today that same girl stood in front of cameras with dry eyes. Holding on to her family for support, 11-year-old Faith Finity stood in front of cameras wearing the same hairstyle that got her kicked out of school. The video of Faith leaving Christ the King School in tears has been viewed more than two and a half million times. School officials say Faith violated school policy by wearing extensions in her hair. Today, her brother, Stephen Finity, spoke on the family's right. behalf. Okay. So I want to ask you to hold this in your heart um, as I'm going through these examples. Um, when I was in the fourth grade, my mother literally had to respond to racist activities and a racist teacher uh, who at my school, when I was going to St. Dominic's Catholic School, she decided to hold me back because she decided that I was not mature enough, that I did not exemplify the principles of citizenship that the school, so from a behavioral standpoint, I didn't uh, exemplify or model the principles of citizenship that the school uh, required or upheld. So she, she decided to hold me back. I literally had to repeat the fourth grade. And so if this is the type of experience that our babies are having when they're unleashed and out, sorry, gone out into the world, my apologies. Um, Think about what this means for them in terms of their ability to respect, um, believe in, come to these systems and institutions uh, in their best 
selves and their best mindsets and the best spirits? You know, what does this do to someone's confidence um, as they're going along in life? It is a heightened emotionality from birth until death, right? So what does it mean to cope with anti-Blackness? Here's another example. What is shameful in this country, this story right here, four Black 12-year-old girls in Binghamton, New York, were giddy and excited during lunch. 12-year-old, y'all, okay? The school, though, didn't like that. Because these four black 12-year-olds were giddy, the school called the girls into the office and attempted to strip search all four of them because they assumed they were on drugs. According to the children, this is exactly what happened. Student A was made to remove her shirt pants and second layer of leggings. Then she was searched in her bra and underwear. Student B was made to remove her shirt and her outer pants. Searched in leggings and bra. Student C was made to remove her shirt and searched in her bra and pants. Student D was searched in her clothing. Received in-school suspension for refusing to remove her shirt and pants. Folks, this search was done by a school administrator and the school nurse. The school district released a statement outlining their policy, saying, quote, a student may, under current law and policy, be searched in a school building by an administrator. These searches may involve an administrator requesting a student empty their pockets, remove their shoes, and or remove their jackets. And the school... So I want to invite you to begin to think about this on the terms of this is not just ignorance or racism or something that's just wrong. This is terrorism and it's cultural terrorism that is built on the foundational principles of anti-Blackness. Now, some may say, well, there. what about the anti-Asian orientation or the anti-Latinx orientation? I would agree with the socio sociologist Joe Fagan while those orientations are definitely realities, they are valid and here with us present in our culture, the anti-Black orientation is the strongest and it is the key foundational principle of white racism. And that is not just uh, my opinion. Um, and so if you read my book, if you read books like Stamped from the Beginning by Dr. Ibram Kendi, if you read um, Black Reconstruction in America by W.E.B. Du Bois. If you read um, one of the papers I quote in my book is Rape as a Badge of Slavery, right? We can just use that as one example. No other, uh, you know, group of women in terms of cultural practice were subjected to ongoing rape, human sex trafficking, and pedophilia in comparison to what Black women experience in this culture. And so that brings me to another point. The exploitation of Black people in America, the exploitation of Black women in America is key to the American cultural fabric and affect. And we have to understand that when these things were done, they were done by good-natured, intellectual, highly educated, people who consider themselves doctors, um, uh, uh, um, <laughs> uh, presidents, governors, law enforcement officials. These people ranked at the highest, in the highest positions of the society. And they created laws and rules and policies that sanctioned that black people were human, but they were to be treated as not only less than human, but they were to be dehumanized, that we were to be dehumanized. And so we then have to understand that this informs the ways in which this orientation I'm speaking about, anti-Blackness, has traveled through centuries because it's been reinforced year after year, decade after decade, century after century. And so people wonder, why is this happening to Black people? Because we're all trained to perpetuate it. And so I, I talk about enemies of Black people. And in not just being 
about white people or non-Black people, but Black people can sometimes be implicated in this. And so the enemies of Black people is anyone who does not investigate and or interrogate the ways in which they relate to Blackness and or Black people on a daily basis. You have to be conscious about the ways in which you come to the anti-Black orientation. And so I know for myself as someone who is lecturing about this in many, on many different platforms at this point, that it is a daily process and discovery for me. You know, we can have someone such as Chris Rock, and I'm not trying to center him, but the way in which he made the comment about Jada Pinkett Smith centering her and chastising her about her appearance in that moment. And we didn't care about or think anything or, 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 or amplify the ways in which Jada Pinkett Smith was feeling in that moment and how she was harmed. And six years prior, 2016, when he hosted the Oscars, he made the comment about Jada Pinkett Smith not attending the Oscars because uh, she wasn't invited and that was similar to him not being invited to Rihanna's panties. Now, would he have made that comment uh, about the, the comment that he made about Rihanna concerning Courtney Cox, concerning um, uh, Amy Schumer or some other white uh, celebrity? I, I argue no. And again, I mean, it plays right into the hand of the ways in which we've been trained to exploit and to sign on to the denigration and degradation of black women and black people overall. So I can contribute. And I wanna be clear about this, all of us, any one of us can contribute to perpetuating the destruction and the genocide that black people are facing today as a collective group in this country uh, by the, the mere psychology that we possess, which is a colonization and an indoctrination that has been developed and designed to have deference to Eurocentricity and to white people, white ways, white ways of speaking, white ways of thinking, white patterns of relating and or being. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm trying to speak um, with a lot of clarity, but also be cautious at the same time. So I'm gonna share some uh, more examples. Your black girl was arrested for, yeah drawing a picture of her bully. In January, a parent of the alleged bully was very upset about the picture and demanded police involvement. The black girl ended up getting handcuffed in front of her classmates, taken into custody and interrogated without her mother, without her mother present. Nothing happened to the child who was bullying her. The American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii wants the police and school officials to change how they handle such situations and compensate the black student's family in the amount of $500,000. Um, I I'm confused here, uh, Robert. She was drawing a, f a photo. She had a drawing. She drew a photo of her bully and got arrested. 10 years old, right? Then we go to, that. that's Hawaii. We come to San Francisco. And this was written about by the Chronicle, the San Francisco Chronicle last year. Black fifth grader was falsely accused of stealing at Safeway. His SS school is fighting back on his behalf. Jamari Oliver walked into the Safeway on Market Street to buy a sandwich for his lunch, which he would eat at school for the first time in more than 14 months. He was excited early on April 26 about seeing his friends that day and feeling proud that his mom let him go into Safeway in the Castro neighborhood by himself. The fifth grader paid for his meal at the deli counter and headed out to meet his mom. Before he made it to the door, two security guards at a, and a store employee stopped him and questioned whether he had stolen the items. He had a receipt, but that wasn't enough. Finally, the store manager told him he could go. So what do you do about this? How do you then go back to school, be functional, be entirely self-composed, be emotionally and psychologically intact, and then compete with others who don't come from a community that's going through this, 
who did not have this personal experience, who now has to contend with the ways in which his confidence has been stifled. And then we say at the end of the year, well, why didn't he pass such and such test or such and such class? I'll tell you why. Because no one can rebound from that. And these impacts and effects are not just personal. They follow us, they are cumulative. And it's not just about this one moment because there are other more less conspicuous nuanced activities and offenses happening to this young child, just like with the others, the, the other four girls who were uh, strip searched, totally dehumanized. How do you come back from that? And that's what I want to inv invite you to today to consider. And we exist in a culture. One of the things that I now understand about whiteness and white supremacy, white culture, is in order to create laws like the Casual Killing Act, in order to write laws that um, continue to absolve white people and anyone that they appointed, uh, when they killed black people, when they murdered black people, and there are many, I quote, I cite many of them in my book. One had to be trained to turn off their emotions. So you have an American culture that has no empathy in terms of the misfortune and terrorism that it inflicts on non-white people and particularly on black people. And there is contempt and hatred for black people because, and that comes through the denial that all of this is going, that all of this is going on. That comes through the, 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 the mere denial of it, okay? I'm gonna play a more recent example that uh, again, brings this a little bit closer to home. This occurred last week here in San Francisco. A Sonoma County teenager says he was detained by police simply for being black. The 13 year old questioned by police outside his Tony San Francisco private school. The officers thought he might have been involved in a car burglary that had just taken place. As NBC Bay Area's Judy Hernandez tells us, the boy's parents are calling it blatant bias. This is where it all happened. A seventh grader had just walked out of the doors to his school to catch a ride home like he does every day when a San Francisco police officer detained him. He said, put your hands behind your back. I was so confused at first. I thought it was like a joke. But 13-year-old Michael quickly learned the officer wasn't joking. Surveillance video shows a police officer putting his hands on the boy. When Michael's tutor tried to intervene, his mother says the officer told them he fit the description of a car burglar and needed to be taken in for questioning. I think what's so shocking is that you had the security guard of his school come out and say he's a child, he's just leaving school. You had the person picking him up saying it and he's the officer's not backing down. San Francisco police wouldn't talk on camera, but over the phone said the officer was acting based on a description from a witness and detained the boy because he closely matched that description. They say they quickly realized the child was not involved in the burglary and immediately released him. But Michael's parents believe he was targeted because he's black. It was totally racial profiling. I want the police department to know that what they did was not okay and how they treated my son is not okay. I started breaking down and crying with my friend because my friend came out and he saw everything. He's like, you good? And we both told each other and we started crying. Michael, who is too upset and scared to show his face, came home with a release certificate from the police department and his parents say a new opinion of law enforcement. My son has been, been changed. He's not the same person anymore. He once was. His innocence is gone now. He has a lot of fear a lot of hatred towards police officers. Michael says he's now scared when he hears sirens. He wants the police department to know what happened was hurtful. Stop doing this to innocent black people. They don't deserve it. No, no, no one deserves it. Just stop doing it. Stern School has issued a statement. They say their student did nothing wrong and was simply leaving school and they fully support him. They say they have filed a formal complaint with the San Francisco Police Department. In
Here's another example of a legal memo that wasn't even real, but the, a company put this together and told one control group that the person writing the memo was Caucasian. And the other person, uh, candidate that wrote, or, or, or uh, person that wrote the memo was African-American, both named Thomas Meyer. The same exact memo, the exact same memo, averaged a 3.2 out of five rating under our hypothetical African-American Thomas Meyer and a 4.1 out of five rating under hypothetical Caucasian Meyer. The qualitative comments on memos consistently were also more positive for the Caucasian Thomas Meyer than our African-American Thomas Meyer. So again, this has to do with people, with what people are thinking. This is the same memo, the hypothetical situation, it's a study. So for Caucasian Thomas Meyer, generally good writer, but needs to work on that, 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 that has potential, good analytical skills. Same memo, black Thomas Meyer needs a lot of work. Can't believe he went to NYU average at best. And so do you know why it is so hard for people to understand the nuances and the depths of anti-Blackness? It's because you can't see it. It's happening moment to moment and it's not implicit. Most people are aware that they like Black people less than they like other people or just plainly dislike Black people or think of them in terms or on the terms of insufficiency, deficiency, inadequacy. It is, it is a, high, it is a, it is a neger, negative hypersensitivity when it comes to the way that which we, we frame, perceive, and or think about Black people. Um, and it's different. And, I'll, and I'm going to uh, share another example with you very quickly. And, it, and there's a, because there is a racial and a political and social agency that is available uh, to white people that is not available to any such other, to non-white people. I mean, some would argue that it may, it is available to other white presenting people that will never be available to black people. And it's highlighted in this article here, uh, this guy, Cochran, he says in this article, I was a teacher for 17 years, but I couldn't read or write. So what does this mean? This means that in the cultural framework, in the, 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 the institutional and cultural setup that we're in, that white mediocrity, white insufficiency, white deficiency is acceptable. Mediocrity, insufficiency, deficiency is only unacceptable when non-white people are involved and, and most distinctly most severely black people. And so this has to inform the ways in which we think about, especially for black people, people who consider themselves, identify as, perceive, or, or, or uh, um, are, are, are a part of the black community who have African ancestry, historically and in society, for the most part, perceive them as black. This has to inform how we think about ourselves because out of all of the examples that I've shown, that I've shared with you today concerning the, 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 the children who are impacted, right? We give them the same time to complete their educational assignments. We give them the same time as others who are not dealing with these degrees of trauma, racialized trauma and terrorism, the same time to compete in school, for employment opportunities. And people have them, who, others who are not dealing with this type of situation, the severity of it, of the, from the effects of it, racial battle fatigue, people who are not dealing with this, they have their mental, spiritual, and emotional faculties available to them to be able to process, compute, participate in activity, and we give no empathy no concern, no care for, or compassion. We have no compassion about the way in which Black people are, are impacted in white America, in white American culture and its institutions. I want to share a few more, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Director Cobbins. This follows us into our adulthood. 
Black homer, homeowner had a white friend stand in for third appraisal. Her home value doubled. Carlette Duffy felt both vindicated and excited, both relieved and angry. For months, she suspected she had been lowballed on two home appraisals because she's Black. She decided to put that suspicion to the test and asked a white family friend to stand in for her during her, an appraisal. Her home's value suddenly shot up a lot. During the early months of the coronavirus pandemic last year, the first two appraisers who visited her home in the historic Slanner House Homes neighborhood just west of downtown valued it at 125,000 and 110,000 respectively. But that third appraisal went differently. To get that one, Duffy, who was African-American, communicated with the appraiser strictly via email, stripped her home of all signs of her racial and cultural identity, and had the white husband of a friend stand in for her during the appraiser's visit. The home's new value, 259,000. It doubled, it more than doubled from the, from the initial appraisal. Here's one more example, and this will be the last one. And this happened here in the Bay Area. A black couple erased themselves from their home to see if the appraised value would go up. It did by nearly $500,000. Paul Austin thought things were going well when the appraiser came to his Marin City home last January. The appraiser complimented the views of the San Francisco Bay, and he was sure to point out all the improvements Austin recalled at an October 13th meeting of a state reparations uh, task force. So he and his wife, Tanisha Tate Austin, were shocked when the appraisal valued their home at 995,000, nearly a half a million dollars less than another appraisal 10 months earlier. The couple who are black got a second opinion last February. This time, they asked a white friend named Jan to sit at the kitchen island and pretend to be the homeowner. They also whitewashed their home by hiding art and family photos. The appraiser said their house was worth 1.4 million, eight, one, 1. 400, I'm sorry, 1.4 million, $82,500. The, the $487,500 discrepancy between the two 2020 appraisals pushed the couple to file a fair housing lawsuit. So these are the things that we are going through everyone that give no place and or attention to the realities of what it means to be Black in a culture that has psychologically, spiritually, and emotionally been trained against Black people. So we're now going to bring the panel, and I'm going to turn it back over to Alexis. Thank you. Thank you, Dante. Um, there's plenty of appreciation for your presentation in the chat. Um, and I've seen Dante present multiple times and every time I'm learning something new, I'm coming to some new epiphany and we are all parenting in this context. And so that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, before we move into the panel discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. Julie Harris is a native of San Francisco and a mother of three children. She's working as a maternal child health care coordinator at West Oakland Health Council and has dedicated her work to improving the disparities impacting melanated and marginalized <clears throat> communities. Daphina Melbourne is the Perinatal Equity Initiative Coordinator and Reproductive Equity Coordinator for Alameda County Public Health Department. She has over 15 years of reproductive justice organizing experience. She is a mother of three and a GG of one. We have Kim Coleman Fox. She is a maternal and child health researcher who is passionate about improving the healthcare experiences and health outcomes of women birthing people and their families, especially black and brown people. She is a proud mother of one and she is currently the Associate Director of Healthcare Interventions at PTBI. And we have Marguerite M. Malloy. She's an experienced labor and employment attorney who has served as the Director of Equity and Engagement <coughs> with the San Francisco Public Defender's Office, among other accomplishments. She feels honored to have served as editor of the 400 Year Holocaust. So um, I guess I will start with Kim. Is there a specific passage from the book that resonates with you and why? Thank you, Alexis and Dante, as always. Um, I am, my heart is heavy by all of the things that you just shared with us. 
you know, all of those videos, just seeing what are what we're exposed to. Um, but that is not the question that Alexis asked me. So I will share a passage. Um, so this is on page 24 of Dante's book, in case anybody has it. And this is in the context of um, Hurricane Katrina, but also about the floods in Mississippi. This is in 1927. So just to set the context. The reality is plain, though painful. America hates Black people. It trains others to hate Black people, including other minorities. To be an American is to be anti-Black. It is to have anti-Black beliefs passed down from generation to generation. It is to obsessively stereotype Black people as being hypersexual and incapable of feeling pain. It is to use us as mere tokens when convenient. It is to degrade us. To be an American is to be indoctrinated by a pro-white European propaganda machine. It is to see Black people as outsiders, people who are suspicious, criminal, ignorant, or otherwise less than. All of the examples that Dante shared with us, particularly the examples of the children, are demonstrations of that. You know, innocent children just going about their lives, being robbed of their childhood because of this anti-Blackness, and again, that is passed down from generation to generation. Thank you, Kim. That also, um, thinking about these examples of the children and everything that he just showed us, I think for myself, I'm a mother as well, a mother of three. And I think it, it for me, it creates a hypervigilance about my children, right? Like I have a teenager, he wants to walk to the stores two blocks away, he should be able to, but I'm so hypervigilant about what could happen to him, how somebody can mistake him, he's tall and he could be mistaken for whoever or fit the description or any of those things. And that's just like, something I'm trying to balance with allowing them to live life and be teenagers and do normal everyday things, right? Um, so I'm going to go to Dafina. Um, is there a specific passage from the book that resonates with you and why? Thank you, Alexis. And yes, I echo Kim's words. Thank you so much, Dante. I too learned so much um, in my heart, also heavy, um, but it also reinforces why this work is important. Um, and so I'm reading a passage from chapter three on page 78, if you have the book. Um, America's founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and both George and Martha Washington, et cetera, encouraged and benefited from mass rape, including of children and pimping, whose bodies did they profit from? Black ones. Such sex abuse was the bedrock of this society, its systems, and its culture. No one sugarcoats history better than white America. White America goes out of its way to ignore the demented, cartoonishly evil history that continues to affect us today. There is a connection to between yesterday's injustices and today's ongoing human rights abuses. And the reason why this passage stood out to me is because the work that we do in reproductive justice largely is to honor Black birthing people and people of color's bodily autonomy. Your right to give birth, not give birth, have access to reproductive choices. And we currently see this attack in many states to deny a pregnant person's right to decide if they want to have a child, to criminalize that decision. And it harkens back to Black people not having bodily autonomy. Our bodies did not belong to us. Our reproductive lives did not belong to us. How many children we could keep and raise for ourselves did not belong to us. And we see this over and over again in the laws and legislation that is being put forth and has been put forth centuries and centuries of time. 
So it's important for me that we recognize that what we're seeing today with the efforts to reduce a birthing person and a woman's capacity to give birth and make that decision is not new. It is ever evolving and changing. It is important that we continue to stand up because we know those who are gonna be impacted the most look like the people on the screen. If you're wealthy, you'll continue to have access to abortion services. If you're wealthy, you'll continue to have access to how many children you have, how you raise them, their lived experiences, their educational attainment. But when you're not wealthy or well off and you look like you look, many of those things are not afforded to us. And it's not on accident, it is on purpose. Thank you for sharing that document. All of that resonates with me um, very much. So I'm going to pass it over to Julie. Is there a specific passage from the book that resonates with you and why? Thank you. And thank you, Darfina. The passage that resonated with me in the book is on page 85. Because um, I am a person of action. And so the passage is, our only hope as Black people is to stop functioning like oppressed people and start acting aggressively, even if that means taking up arms to defend our own selves and our children. Self-defense is legal and appropriate. And that spoke to my soul. Not only while I read Dante's book did I feel like he was narrating the soundtrack to my life experience, but it also fortified me in, in how I approach my children. Um, you know, their father, he, he makes deliveries during the day and we speak often and on video and my children can hear, you know, specifically white people harassing their dad. And they ask me like, mom, what is going on? You know, why are they keep asking him, what are you doing here? And policing everything that he's doing. Mind you, he's in his full uniform. And I had to just be honest with her and tell her, you know, and tell my children, White people suffer from a sickness called racism. And it is my responsibility to fortify them and give them the tools to navigate this landscape. Not only has Dante helped change the landscape of my mind and the mind of the mother is what raises the mind of the children, um, is that you know I have to fortify her with the tools and fortify them with the tools, not only to navigate this world to survive, but to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I just happened to see in the chat that somebody asked if you could put the page number down so they can find that passage in the book. Page 85. Page 85. And um, Marguerite, is there a specific passage from the book that resonates with you and why? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, be part of the space with the powerful women and Dante and our interpreters and hosts and guests. And I say thank you. I want to make sure I start there. I want to say a couple of things. One is that um, Dante's book speaks to some of the issues around Black maternal health in a number of places. Um, in a broad way, he speaks about it in chapter three when he talks about the lives of Black women and how we have been seen and treated and made more like commodities and um, to serve the whims and wishes of whites. He talks about it um, in chapter seven when he talks about the role of science and medicine as it relates to how racial constructs uh, came about. And um, he speaks about it specifically on pages 146 through 147 and 212 and 213. But what I wanted to focus on at this moment is that one of the biggest messages I take from the work is for me on page 207. And it's primarily because my background is 20 years of being a labor and employment attorney and now working in the criminal legal system uh, with the public defender's office. But this issue hit home in very significant ways. On page 207, First, Dante quotes words by Charles Scharf, who was the president of Wells Fargo, the CEO of Wells Fargo. And the words he quotes are, while it might sound like an excuse, 
the unfortunate reality is that there is very little, a very limited pool of black talent to recruit from, close quote. And then the part that I wanna focus on which just hits home based upon that quote that he uses from the CEO of Wells Fargo. He says, this is part and parcel of anti-black racism. Racism reduces the view of institutions and systems to individual failings of black people. Anti-black racism prevents examination of institutions and systems as flawed, rooted in white supremacy and anti-blackness. Anti-blackness minimizes the magnitude of these types of thought patterns and beliefs. In this moment, Schroff, the CEO's statements, accidentally admitted to the world what he and so many others truly believed. And why this hits home for me is because I often describe Dante's work in many ways as, as the editor to many people. One of the things I try to emphasize is that this paragraph and much of the work identifies for us all how the system we live in, the air we breathe, the water that we swim in every day, the oxygen is so embedded and in depth with anti-black racism that we are allowed to see the system is not existing and instead to see our shortcomings as identified by others or being judged by others or in failure as de defined by this, this culture. We identify those things as personal traits, personal flaws, uh, things that we need to work on. And that is a fatal flaw and the damage of the system is that we're not allowed to criticize and observe and point out the failings of this system. We are left instead to determine that our outcomes are within our control and that when we don't achieve the outcomes that they have defined as being improved or, or better or, or superior, that we are failures, that we are damaged goods. And that's essential for me and others to understand that we are not damaged goods, rather we are superior beings in that we have survived cumulative trauma century after century after century, and we're still standing. I'll leave it there. Thank you. And um, this next question, feel free to just come off mute and answer it as you feel led. Um, but what has it meant for you to examine and understand? Can I just comment on what Marguerite just said? Mm -hmm. I think that is vital for anyone listening in today who has Black children and or who is Black. The fact that this culture and the system and the expectations that are rendered through these institutions, whether it be the educational sector or whether it be employment, are through a white idea, white ideals and principles and designs of how we need to show up, how we need to perform. So if we take the one and a half hour class or we send our children to school and they don't get the way that the science lesson was taught, if they don't get the way in which the linguistic principles was, was taught, if they don't do it in a particular amount of time and also are unable to compete with the ways in which other children were who actually got or understood the way that the lesson was taught through those white principles and white ideas of education, then they are deficient. And many times what I have experienced as not just a, a black male, but as a black son, a black nephew with, uh, a, 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 and a black cousin, I have cousins, I've got siblings, that we will take those white ideas and use them to reinforce the value and the worth of our children. And it shows up by saying things like, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you get an A or B? You got a bad grade on this test? What's, what's what, something must be wrong with you? Why are you not able to get X, Y, Z? And all of a sudden our children become our enemies because we are using white principles and ideas and, and a belief system to perpetuate anti-black and white supremacist terrorism onto our children. And we, we take their confidence away. We take their sense of self-worth away. So much so that by age 13 or age 14, they're wanting to drop out of school. They're no longer interested because the denigration and the degradation is not just coming from the school, 
but it's being reinforced at home. And so now I drop out and what is there to do? Maybe I'll become a prostitute because there's sometimes maybe some young person that's decided they want to become a pimp um, who is appearing friendly to me and they embrace me with open arms or maybe I'll go sell drugs. Do, do we really understand the magnitude? Are we seeing the depths of how this works and how it shows up and is perpetuated? within our community. I mean, this is very deep. So I'm, I'm gonna thank you for allowing me to, to say this. Thank you, Dante. I think that context you just provided was very helpful. It definitely has me thinking about some things in the ways that I am interacting with my children. Um, and so to the panelists, um, feel free to come off mute and answer this as you feel led. But what has it meant for you to examine and understand anti-Blackness as a legally sanctioned cultural creation um, in your identity as a Black woman and as a Black mother or grandmother? Alexis, I, I will start and just say that while I knew this in the back of my mind, more and more I understand that no Black person is safe, no matter what doesn't matter if you follow the rules. It doesn't matter how res well respected you are in your own community or in the white community, you know, the community at large. It really, it, it doesn't matter because you are a black person and we are living in this anti-black racist society. And so you will forever be a target or at, at risk of some sort of danger. Um, I, I also just want to say, um, just in response to what Marguerite was saying and also what Dante was saying, as a black parent, and my child is an adult, but I realize part of my job is to support her and make sure that she understands that she, there's nothing wrong with her. She's just fine. But there is a problem with the society that we live in and the, the fact that no matter how good she is, she will not be seen for just who, who she is. She will be defined by her black skin and her, she will be viewed as less than. And I just wanna respond as well to what Dante said and echo Kim. And I've told Dante this personally, but I also wanna to speak to everyone on here. As a parent, I had to do a hard, hard, hard pivot in my parenting. I had to change my mind frame. I had to change the things I was saying to my children about the system they're entering into for school. I had to change the language and speak life into them as they enter into this landscape. Um, and it was something that really awakened me um, and I needed beyond, beyond measure, beyond words. Um, so that was one of the, the huge revelations and things that I took away from everything that Dante has taught, shared, you know, and I've been in, in community with every single person on here. Um, and so that has really shaped and changed so much for me. And I, and I can't be more thankful for just being able to be awakened, um, even at whatever cost, you know, because it can be painful, believe it, but needed, worth it. I will just add um, to those of you who are parenting on this call today. When your children come home and they say, my teacher doesn't like me, believe them. Don't send them back in that environment without really truly assessing what is going on. Because we send our kids into these schools and we know from the way that schools are funded, a lot of times these teachers come in with no experience, no cultural congruency to our children. And they hurt our children. They hurt their spirit. 
they diminish their, their capacity around being able to learn because they start to believe the things the teachers are saying to them. And when your child comes home and they say, my teacher doesn't like me, sit with that. Talk to your child. Because I will say nine times out of 10, they're not making that up. They are being maligned. They are being ostracized. They are being talked down to by the educator. And as their parent, as their advocate, it is your job to love them, support them in those spaces and go into that school, change the class if you need to, bring it up to the administrators, remove your child from that school altogether, but don't dismiss it when your child says someone in the school doesn't like them because the odds are they don't because they're a black child and they've already been perceived as not having the ability to learn, not having the ability to get along with others, being too loud. It's okay for your children to shine and you want your child in an environment where whatever talents they bring to this table when they walk into a classroom are honored, not maligned and not pushed to the side. So if your child says somebody doesn't like me, believe them and fight for your child and show them that you have their back because we're sending kids and we think that sending our kids to these private schools and these predominantly white neighborhoods is going to give them a better education and it might, but what other education are they getting from going into that school? Because they're definitely not getting support about their blackness in these environments at all. They're being taught to conform. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to add to what you were saying. It'll only get them the education that they need to be able to somewhat survive in a system and culture that is a white supremacist system and culture. So it, it'll, it'll give them the education that they need in order to produce and do what white people want them to produce and to be able to do. And yet it will also make them void of the experience, the, their primary experience and, and what they will endure in life. So then they get to age 30 or 35 and they find themselves in therapy because no one has explained that in the words of Jay-Z in his song, uh, the story of OJ, you are still black. He uses another word, but he says, no matter what you accomplish, no matter what you do, you are still black. And so this whole idea that, oh, we have to make sure that we support our children to uh, get an education. Well, what does that mean? We're educating them to do what? We're educating, we, we have stats that show that even when black people and particularly black men, black boys, come from the richest, the wealthiest families, they are more likely to end up poor. That study is real. So this fascination or, or occupation or preoccupation with educating ourselves in uh, white America and aligning it with principles of white upward mobility, is, is, it's, it serves to further legitimize the system as it, as it is. It serves to um, further validate the normalcy of it, the normality of it. And we have to see the system, a system that does not care about people, that was built on the principles of dehumanizing, dehumanizing people and destruction. We have to see something wrong with that system, right? Because it was okay to create this orientation, normalizing an anti-Black cultural affect and situation and, and, and as long as, you know, free Black people, if you will, and others who were not a part of our community saw something wrong with the ways in which that was done concerning enslaved Black people, and as long as they were able to see themselves outside of that idea, we, have been, we were able to contextualize it in terms of historiography, that this is something that happened long ago. But now what we see, and this is what I speak about, these laws that were created in, during the antebellum period, they were not only concerned with enslaved black people, they were concerned with Negroes 
And that is very clear throughout all of them. And so now what we see is out of slavery, out of the uh, confines or the period of white illegality where there, the, the exploitation and the uh, discrimination was more conspicuous, it's cultural practice. And so we illegality has been replaced by unaffordability, but we're okay with unaffordability because that's not explicit in terms of language, in terms of looking at a, a word on a legal document and saying, oh, this is for whites only, but we're okay with it in practice. We're okay with it in our schools. We're okay with it in terms of our jury selection, in terms of who, our, who makes up our population of attorneys, judges. Uh, we're okay with it who, in terms of who lives in our spaces, who lives in our neighborhoods and who doesn't. And I'm talking about in terms of white people and those of us who are gatekeepers of whiteness. So I apologize. Thank you, Jafina. I was going to jump in to, 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 to add that um, this week for me, a week about Black maternal health has elevated for me the significance and the importance of our daily health as we walk as Black moms or grandmoms or aunts or, or aunties or as we walk in that way. But it's also important and elevates to me the importance of identifying young Black women who are expecting to become pregnant, hoping to become pregnant or are pregnant, or who have suffered a miscarriage or suffered a loss in, in pregnancy, that I begin to think about ways that I live and conduct myself to support and encourage that and encourage their health and their well-being. And it's because we realize that access to health care as a Black mom or as a Black woman is something that speaks to an issue of a right, a right to life, a right to freedom from discrimination because of my skin color and my condition, and a right to the highest standards of health care and health that I'm able to achieve and I shouldn't be prevented from achieving. So in this week, I elevate for myself the importance of identifying the things that we need to do to counsel, to educate, to um, to advocate for things that will improve the health of Black women who are already moms, who hope to be moms, who are unable to be a mom, who's lost a child, or who has, has had a severe health crisis in childbirth, that we find ways to support that, whether we support it through the church, and advocating the church through educational programs around this issue, so that young people don't think that, well, having a baby just automatically just happens in life. If you are fortunate enough to become pregnant, you may not have that child because of the, the world we live in and the healthcare system we operate in and your access to healthcare or your access to those resources. Or if you're, if you're having struggles becoming pregnant, you need to be given resources and access to what your alternatives are or how to navigate that system. Or if you are pregnant and are experiencing some of the many cardiovascular related conditions that are so related to black maternal mortality in, in, in childbirth, that we educate you about that. Because if those conditions were identified earlier, before you're pregnant or in your pregnancy, that might help you sustain, go through your pregnancy. So I, I just look at ways we can think about how to support uh, people who are ready to or prepared to or having or have lost a child and how we can do that in this week. So this, how we walk around as black moms every day in the stresses and the traumas cumulatively that we live in as black people, but how do we support young people or people who are at the point in their lives when they want children or want to be a mom through adoption or other means? Thank you all so much. I see a lot of activity in the chat. I don't know if people have questions. If you have questions, um, now is the time to put them in the Q&A section. I also see hands raised. So I'm thinking people might just have comments and maybe not a question um, per se. So I can, if you have a comment, raise your hand and I'll call on you and we'll get you unmuted so you can say what you need to say. If you have a question, for Dante or any of the other panelists, please drop it into the chat or the Q&A section of the chat. So I'm gonna go to those with their hands raised. Um, and if, it, if I call you and it's accidental, you can just lower it or uh, let me know. 
So I see Melanie Pena has her hand raised. She was on mute. I'm not sure if she's able to comment now, so I will move on to Loretta. Okay, moving on to Alyssa. I don't know if something's happening where they're not able to get off mute. <laughs> Alexis, there is a couple questions in the um, in the chat. In the chat. In the question. I, don't I don't have the option to unmute. I see a mute by their thing, but it's not giving me an option to unmute people. Um, let's go to the questions. I'm try if you have a question, it'd be helpful if you could put it in the Q and A because the chat is very lively, but I can try to scroll through the chat to find the questions. Um, I see Pamela Johnson. Are you able to get off mute? I don't know. I think something's happening. Is hey, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm just appreciating um, all that I'm hearing. And thanks to Dante and the panelists, just to everyone. I have a question. Where as Black people do we go from here? Meaning that we know racism ain't going nowhere. Um, you know, one of the first things I think of is we have to continue to tell our people our history, our true history. But just wondering, you know, because all of this, as we know, we live it every day, can be overwhelming. Uh, what do we do to move forward? Oh. <laughs> I'd like to take a stab. I, I know Dante may want to uh, jump in there, so I'll let you go first, Dante, if you want to take a stab at that. No, go ahead. Um, I think you've seen put in the chat, and I'm not sure if your question specifically relates to Black maternal health or um, the issues that Dante is speaking about more globally, kind of what we breathe, our air and our oxygen and water we swim in every day. Um, I think more, that- More globally, more, more just like more as globally. black people, you know, thank you, um, thank you. just thank how you. do we deal with racism moving forward? Like what, what can we do? I mean, for me, some of the immediate things come to mind is to just remind our people about who we truly are, our achievements, you know, um, and just wanted to hear some of your feedback also that I could teach my nieces and nephews, you know, as well, the younger generation. Okay. And so I, I think I, probably all the panelists will, will be able to respond to that, but I'll let you start, Dante. I, I just want to say that we must create and be vigilant about creating community with other Black people who are educated, mm -hmm. who are educated about and understand the nuances, the complexities, and the hi histories, and the perpetual nature of white supremacy and anti-Blackness. We must understand how it works through everything to inflict this type of harm. One of the things that, have, that has helped me, um, and again, I, I go back to my mother, raising me around a lot of, of different um, types of Black people. So I learned what it meant to be black through, through many different expressions. And she also instilled a certain type of confidence that did not, that let me falter. So I think community is important. It really does take a village to raise a child, but we also have to understand the ways in which we work off these principles of anti-black daily. We reinforce them about ourselves. It's in the way that we choose to, that we don't value our natural beauty, but we go to the beauty shop to get hair or to get our hair done or straightened or right. you know, eyelashes because we bought into these societal norms. We also need to locate uh, black professionals in the forms of um, clinical social workers, therapists who understand racialized trauma and racial battle fatigue. I put a document over in the chat. We also have to understand how racial battle fatigue shows up in us. So that when we, you know, I talked, I spoke about my friend Lanisha Ann Williams, who passed her away last year in, in her 40s from cancer. There was nothing else that contributed to her early death 
and, and the ways in which many other black people experience that situation other than the tenets of anti-black racism all she could do within the last several months of her death was agonize over the way that her job and people at her job mistreated her she was reciting these instances on her deathbed hmm. okay so so all cancer cancer is is inflammation it's hmm. stress heightened inflammation from stress so we, we have to understand, but we also have to be more compassionate so that we don't blame Black people for the circumstances that we find ourselves in and find each other in. You know, mm -hmm. such, such and such didn't uh, make it through high school. So what? So what? It, 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 it says nothing, it means nothing about who they are. That is a, a white ideal that, that Black people has have acclimated to and have convinced ourselves that that is of some value and will be of some use to them. When the entire world, if there's so much more to those people than sizing up their gifts and talents behind a, a, a white institution and or principles that these institutions and culture have erected and constitute are the necessary you know, ways to, to go about life. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's insanity. So we have to change the way in which we come to this, that we think about it, that we think about other people. So that so then we are not the odd people out. We are not doing harm further to our further to our community and to the people in our community and who are around us because we are thinking on terms, thinking of them, thinking of their situations, our situations and everything through a white framework of anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. And that is why I, I, I use the word psychopathy and sociopathy because it is menacing. It is terrorism. The psychology of it all is terrorism. So how True. can we be, how can we be kinder, gentler, have more compassion and use these institutions and our resources in terms of what we know to create better conditions and situations for black people? That's what I'm concerned about. People say, why isn't your work more inclusive of everybody else? Because everybody else is not in this predicament. My work is not concerned about inclusion in that. Why isn't America more inclusive? <laughs> why is it, does it function and continue to be a pro-white country? It is time for people to be pro-Black, okay? And there's other work that speaks to the needs of other communities. My work is very specific. So does anyone else want to say anything? No, that was excellent. I get it. That was excellent. I, I do, Dante. I, I wanted to add that. Think about where we would be standing today or sitting today or where we would be today in our being if the information contained in Dante's work was commonly known by black people. Let's just, just, just pause a moment. Who would be if everybody who was black understood these truths? Just, just hold that. Hold the power that that offers us. I, I, I cannot tell you that anything more than my heart bursts with understanding, not just the joy I would feel or we would feel, but the power we would hold if we understood these truths and how we would change our being and change this world if we understood those truths. So the next step or the most is to get the book, <laughs> is to read the book is to digest the book. It's to talk about the book. It's to share the book. It's to read and absorb and digest and understand the truth in the book, the truth about who we are and what we've lived and what we continue to live and what we experience every day and just process the truth. And I say that and I'll end here because Dante knows I can go on is that White people don't want others to understand that minorities 
can rule. This is supposed to be about a, a de democracy, a majority. Minorities can rule. And if that doesn't sit with you, hold on a moment because white folk in the United States right now are no longer a majority. Other folk make up the majority. But who's ruling? White folk. So let's just process that if we could be at a different place spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, psychologically with the truths that are out there in Dante's book, understand what power we would have. I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you, Marguerite. That was very powerful. It was powerful reflection for us to close out on as we're winding down our time. Um, what's resonating for me right now is thinking about all of our mothers and grandmothers, fathers, grandparents, people that parented us and brought us through in this context. So um, I'm specifically thinking about my grandmother, Luberta Lewis, who raised 15 children in Mississippi with a elementary school education and my other grandmother Ernestine Battle who raised eight children in Georgia and my own mother who raised two girls in Oakland California as a single mother and just all the things that they had to go through and I'd like to invite you all now to put names in the chat of those people that parented you and brought you through um, this context I feel like it's important for us to honor those people so and as you're um, putting those names in the chat Dante, before I close out, I'd like to invite you to leave us with a final closing word. And then I have a couple of announcements before we leave. Absolutely. And on that note, I just want to call out the name of, again, my mother, Deborah King Cooper, her mother, who was Mamie Arthur, Arthur Edgar, uh, and her mother, who was not Arthur, as well as um, my father's mother, Kareem King, um, and just so many of the Black women. My godmother, her name is Sarah Fine, my auntie, um, Lynn um, Weaver, um, my godmother, Barbara Hill, uh, my mentor, Barbara Page, Dr. Rochelle Rogers-Art, Virgie Maney. There are so many people who have been in my path. Um, black women, and I would not be here today if it were not for black women. Black women have saved my life and has been the, have been the foundation that I rest upon. So I wanna close with this quote. Um, the first thing I'll just say is this, I'm gonna put these links to courses back in the chat. If your job will pay for you to attend um, one of these courses, either the May or July one, please get them to pay for you so we can spend two days together fully unpacking this. I will also be offering a fellowship that I'm working on. I can't say much about it right now, but uh, in September, it will most likely launch in September. And it's called un Unlearning. Unlearning. Un unlearning and addressing anti-Blackness. Because we really have to dig deep to be able to unlearn all of this. And to the last point that was made, one of the last points that was made by Marguerite, in terms of where our security lies and does not lie. You know, I'm reminded of this quote by Dr. Amos Wilson and where he says, he says, I keep trying to warn black people and I warn you again and again, your security does not reside in civil rights laws. A law is merely writing on books and writing does not protect people. The law is only as strong as those who enforce it. And you've got the law written by your enemy and enforced by your enemy, which means that when the enemy decides to stop enforcing it, it's over for you, or the enemy can decide to rewrite it. How many times has this happened in history? It is happening now. Progress is not linear and you have to interrogate the understanding and the information that has set up your ideas for progress about what progress looks like and what you will 
and will not accept. Thank you. I see comments in the chat that the link that was dropped for your training wasn't working, but we can make sure that link is sent to everybody that registered. Um, also, this recording will be made available so people can come back and reflect on this. And I wanna thank you all for joining our April Collaboratory. If you want to continue to be in community with us um, specifically today, um, this evening, we will also have an event at 5.30 that features Julie Harris along with Breezy Powell and Brandy Gates Burgess, um, where they'll be sharing um, their stories of birthing and parenting with joy, tales of Black resilience and resistance. And this will be a virtual space of storytelling, centering the voices of Black birthing and parenting individuals. And the link to RSVP will be in the chat. Next month for our May Collaboratory on May 3rd, we will hear about bringing an anti-racism lens to implementation research and centering communities to inform prenatal care in Fresno. One of our graduated PTBI fellows, Dr. Bridget Blabu, has organized this fantastic session with expert implementation researcher, Dr. Rachel Shelton from Columbia University, Fresno community champion, Dr. Venice Curry, and anti-racism researcher, Dr. Derek Griffith from Georgetown University. The link to RSV, RSVP to that will also be in the chat. We thank you for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your day. My skin is black. My arms are long. enough to take the pain inflicted again well done